All right, y'all, thanks for joining. It is October 24th, and um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, debt collection. Oh, gosh, it's so pedantic. No, we're going to talk about some interesting things. I want to share with you some understanding that may help you in other areas. Um, but uh, so I have a lot of material on aceofcoins.club. I have uh, segments, video segments and series on different subjects. And one of the subjects is consumer debt. I forget what the title is, but you'll uh, you'll see it uh, when you go log in there and check it out. Um, and now I'm going to add some new content, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about it. I think officially for the first time tonight. I haven't brought this up before, but I just I need to bring it up because you need to have this little bit of knowledge and understand what kind of uh, exposure these lawyers have that are involved in debt collection. So I'm talking about unsecured debt collections, and I find that when I'm talking to people about this. They are fumbling through papers and they don't even know what they don't even know who they're dealing with. I, I, my first basic question is when they call me on the phone, I just got served. My funds got levied by them. And I say, who's them? You know, and they can't even tell me the name of the plaintiff. They don't even know who the plaintiff is. And I'm like, right. you got to you got to know that part of the game. Come on. You know, if you're playing football, you got to know which which direction you're supposed to be running. <laughs> you let's start there, you know. So. So the people I'm talking with this week, it just seems like they kind of come in waves, right? So this week, there's debt collections, and debt collectors are not the creditor. The creditor typically is going to be your brand name, understood, recognized, like Citibank, mm -hmm. Bank of America, right? American Express, mm -hmm. some person that lent you money, okay? That's mm -hmm. a debt collector is somebody who did not lend you money, who's claiming that you owe him the money by some thing, like Maybe he's the assignee of the debt. Maybe he's the purchaser of the debt, right? <laughs> and I could tell you since the early 90s when I started doing this work in literally like 30, 40,000 cases, mm -hmm. I have never seen an, an actual correct assignment agreement of a debt from a creditor to a debt collector. And I look at it very carefully. So let me just share with you how I, how I look at this. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Ah, <laughs> so they can say all kinds of stuff, right? But it's important what's in the allegations and what's in the exhibits and what they can prove. And I just tear them apart every time. And I'm going to show you how to tear them apart, how to analyze the pleading, and then how to mop the floor with them and make them pay you money. Okay. Make them beg you to accept the money. I'm not exaggerating. So you get sued by Midland, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's which I. <laughs> collector. Now, this is an important distinction to make. The bank, the creditor, Citibank, is not a debt collector, is not liable under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, Title 15, United States Code, Section 1692. Check it out. Yeah. All right. Now, when I first read that, I was like, eh, okay. that's why of... they sell it. That's why they sell it. OK, well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He because jumped, they, they're, they're going to get paid five times on the debt amount. OK, they're making okay. five times their money. Yes, it's insured. It's written off. They get to collect twice. OK, so. The, the, there's a there's a debt collector that's liable under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And the really nice thing is the lawyer, the individual lawyer, the attorney who represents the debt collector is a debt collector under the law. So if Citibank is suing, it's not the debt collector, but the lawyer is. Not only is the lawyer the debt collector, but the idiots always put in the name of their law firm. So that brings that law firm into the same liability as a separate debt collector. Now, wow. you're thinking, okay, John, so so what? Look, the more debt collectors we have in a debt collection, the more money you can make. Mm -hmm. So for every FDCPA claim you can make, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act claim you can make under that act, against a debt collector. So for example, Midland sues you. You think, well, why, why would I sue Midland? How could I, what kind of claim can I make against Midland? Well, let me give you one example. Midland sues me and I go ahead and answer the complaint, but let's not talk about that. I, instead, I sue them in the, in the federal court. And I sue them because they're involved in an unfair and deceptive collection practice. What? 
Why is that unfair and deceptive? Well, because Midland is not the assignee and is not the uh, purchaser of the debt. It just got my name off the internet. Why do I say it like that? Because they'll never be able to prove that it that it's the assigner, that it was assigned the debt. Though there's no chain of title to the debt. Okay, just just trust me on that one. There's no chain of there's no valid chain of title. They can't prove it. So for all we know, they use modern data collection at Intellius.com and got my name and an address or something from a mailing list and then decided to make a claim on me. But here's the other thing, and, and I'm kind of going ahead of myself here, but let me just do that. So you have the debt collector and the other debt collector. You have Midland and his attorney. Sometimes there's two uh -huh. You have the law firm. So the fine, the penalty for violating the FDCPA is $1,000. You can only get $1,000. If they have 15 violations per person, you only get $1,000 but you want more people. So if there's a, a lawyer at Midland and then there's like the law firm, you get $3,000 if you sue them for an unfair and deceptive collection practice. Now, the way I always get them is the the law firm, and you guys gotta meet yourself here. The law firm, the law firm is a debtor under the FDCPA. It's liable under the FDCPA. The attorney is, and so is the debt collector. So you file a claim in federal court uh, for unfair and deceptive collection practices for $1,000 each. So that's a $3,000 claim. Now, what goes hand in hand with the debt collection is a credit report, right? So on the credit, you're going to find that Midland shows up. Ooh, that's another violation. If you violated the FDCPA, you also violated the FCRA because you didn't have the standing, but yet you made a report on my credit. I didn't tell you the, I didn't tell you the punchline yet. I didn't tell you the real deal yet. So I'm telling you how this multiplies, right? So you have three debtors under the FDCPA, that's $3,000. And then you got another $1,000 penalty under the FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act, for putting items on your credit that are not accurate. So that's what, $6,000? What about in the state of Georgia, Ray? Or what about in the state of California or Florida? Is there a state version of the federal FDCPA? Yeah, there is. I think it's the unfair business practice or something like that for Georgia. But anyways, so you got $3,000 plus $3,000 for federal, federal statute violations. And then you take those same set of facts and you have a separate cause of action for state violations under the state version of those federal laws. So now you got not $6,000, but you got $12,000 you can file against these lawyers just because Midland sued you. Just because it sued you. Now, the real, the, the death knell, here's how you kill them. The debt collector does not own the debt. He does not have an interest in the debt. Midland does not, I guarantee you, does not have an interest in the debt. And the lower the debt, the more likely it is the law firm is the debt collector and is naming Midland as the debt collector. It's lying. It's making material misrepresentations to the court. That's a no-no. That's a no-no if you're a lawyer, okay? If I make this argument, I've tried this before, trust me, tens of thousands of times, I made the argument in the very early days thinking I was so smart. I'm going to make this argument. I'm going to tell the judge. And they completely ignored it. That meant I had to take it to the U.S. District Court. I took the federal court. So when I took the federal court, they don't want the federal judges to see what they're doing. They don't want this to be on the record. And the federal judges don't want to see it. They don't want it on the record. They don't want to rule on a case like this. It makes them look bad. So they will immediately contact you to settle. Can you imagine that? Turn it right around on them. And they're going to be so quick to want to settle with you. So we did this as an experiment. I'll tell you the, the story in just a minute. But let's let's go back to a pleading. So you want to know who's suing you, the debt collector. And the debt collector has to have standing. And he gets standing by being the actual purchaser of a debt that you owed somebody else. And there has to be a, like the right of assignment or there has to be some legal standing to actually be assigned the debt. But I always give them the benefit of the doubt because I can beat them on so many other things. I just say, okay, fine. You guys have the right to get the assignment. Fine. Prove it. And that's where they cannot do that. So you got the debt collector and then you got the pleading. The pleading is the complaint. 
So this is what this applies everywhere. So when I'm talking like I'm talking to somebody on like a child custody case like today and I'm asking uh, uh, what what is the pleading say? What was the what was the request to the court regarding we're at child custody now, but did, was this a petition for child custody? Was this a petition for dissolution of marriage, you know, declaration or whatever? So you start at the beginning. What are the allegations? What was the, what is the pleading? What was the complaint that was filed? What was asked of the court? You start there. So if I look at a, a, a case like Midland, for example, Midland doesn't even have good records. Most banks don't have good records these days. So what they'll do is they, they'll just have a bill, they, a copy of a bill they sent you, okay? Or they'll have a copy of a credit application or an example of a credit card agreement where you didn't even sign it. There's no in, indication that you even read it ever. So they don't have records to establish the debt. So here's what they've done. Over the years, and I would say probably in the 90s, the lawyers started amending see every year you can submit and even you can do this even if you're not a lawyer you can do this but lawyers submit recommendations or proposals to amend the rules of civil procedure and of course they make it easier for themselves to get the judgment for their clients because they look good right so if before like in the 70s if you sued somebody on a credit card debt who didn't pay you would sue for breach of contract or default right and you have to prove that case now they made it to where you don't sue for breach of contract. You sue for what comes out to be only that you sent a bill and there was no objection. It doesn't even matter if the person owed. This is what they do. So what they did is they had a new set of pleadings that allowed the attorneys to file a suit called stated account or open account. So it's a very low burden of proof. It's probably lower than a traffic ticket. I mean, really, they got themselves a really good system. So they sue you for stated account or open account or sometimes breach on breach on a contract or something like that. But the but the stated account, all the case law works like this. The stated account is there has to be some underlying debt. Right. So they still have to prove the case. But if you don't know that you stop there and what's your defense? You don't know what your defense is because you don't realize that there has to be some underlying debt. So then you ask them when you know this, where's the underlying debt? First of all, how do you have standing to sue me? Are you the assignee? Show me the assignment agreement. Show me the purchase agreement. And what they'll show you is if there is a purchase agreement, it'll be of a tranche or a block of credit card debt that has nothing to do with the case. <laughs> it doesn't even identify your account, okay? And that's because that's not how the banks deal with each other. They don't- They, they don't like taxes. <laughs> Oh yeah, don't get me started on that one. They don't they don't sell individual accounts like that. Okay, they they buy them in blocks. So they they buy them by county and they assign them to law firms. Okay, in in batches, right? Not individually. So they can never prevail because their business model is horrible. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't it's not consistent with the rules. Okay, if if you understand this, so there has to be like I've told you every single time there has to be standing. You have to have standing, and we always get them on the standing. They don't have standing. They say they do, Midland, Citibank, all of them, okay? Uh, and so you wanna scrutinize it from that point. So there's several causes of action for a credit card debt, stated account, open account, breach of contract. Sometimes they sue you for unjust enrichment. There's different criteria for each cause of action. And you can go on the internet and find out what they are and find out if it was alleged. Now, a lot of times it's alleged properly because they do it for so many times that they have the proper allegations in there. The trouble they run into is that they don't have the substance behind it. There's no, there's no substance. There's no underlying debt. There's no evidence of it. So one of the one of the methods I use is I get a complaint. Let's say I want to argue a complaint on the merits. Let's say Midland sues, and so I'm going to file a motion to dismiss, and I'm going to I'm going to tear apart the pleading. I'm going to say, well, you're alleging the debt, but your exhibits demonstrate something else, or don't demonstrate anything. You're not. You're, you're alleging a debt, but your exhibits don't show the debt that you've alleged. So they conflict with each other, right? So this defeats the court's ability to hear the case. It's called lack of jurisdiction, right? So that's what I look for is where I can show there's a conflict in the exhibits with the allegations. Now, an exhibit is an allegation. So you might have like 10 or 12 or 20 or 50 allegations, numbered allegations in your complaint. And then you'll have exhibit A, B, C. Each of those exhibits is another allegation. So if one allegation conflicts with the other, like, for example, if, if you allege breach of contract, and you say he broke the contract on this date. And then the next thing is that you say I, he never broke the contract. <laughs> the court can't hear the case. It's that simple. So if you can show the judge that there's a conflict of allegations, 
you're going to do really well. Now, a lot of times the judges think that's interesting and they just want to hear the case and they'll deny your motion. So that's all right. So, all right, you have to get into the case, right? So what you do is you answer the complaint. If the judge denies your motion to dismiss, you answer the complaint and you take the argument you made in the motion to dismiss and you copy and paste it, okay, on your documents. You literally make the same word for word argument as an affirmative defense in the answer. The reason why you do that is so that you can ask for a similar dismissal later on. So if your motion to dismiss was denied, you can ask for summary judgment later on by making that affirmative defense. So the defense never goes away. OK, uh, so anyways, this is how we do it. Now, the trick is if you want to if you have to make the defense later, if you have to file an answer because your motion was denied, you want to ask for summary judgment. The way to do it is to ask for summary judgment when discovery is completed. Discovery means each party has to ask the other party questions to try to prove his case. OK, so when you file your answer, you want to send off discovery questions with your answer because you wanted to do discovery before the other side does discovery, which allows you to answer their discovery last if they do discovery. So you want to be last to answer discovery. Give yourself that option so that when you answer discovery last with your answer, with your last discovery response, you're going to file a motion for summary judgment. The, the key thing being this key strategy is you want to ask for summary judgment before they do. That gives you a lot of leverage with the court. It gives you credibility and also gives you a lot of leverage because it's more difficult if you have to come back with a cross motion for summary judgment because you're both saying there's nothing worth going to trial over. I should win. If you say it first, it's easier. If you have to say that second, you have to give a very specific set of facts as to why. Okay. So I know that sounds maybe a little bit complicated, but this is how you analyze it. You cannot... You cannot defend yourself verbally. You can't just show up like, you know, someone calls you a name. If someone's suing you, first of all, you never negotiate with them, okay? That's like with the credit card companies. You don't negotiate with credit card companies. You're already in court. You already negotiated. That's why you're in court. There was a deal and they allege you failed to comply. You failed to, you know, your default, right? That's what they allege. You can't now negotiate. You already did that. Now it's time to fight. You argue, they argue. That's what you have to do. Say, no, I didn't do it. They say, yeah, you did do it. Then you have to rely on the evidence and the procedure and all that stuff. So uh, when you, you when someone accuses you of something, defaults on a credit card, you have to respond in kind. You have to write a written response. So you can tell the court why it doesn't have jurisdiction or why the case should be dismissed. And or you can just answer the complaint. You can deny the allegations. Sometimes you can admit them. I like to deny them all. It's just easier. You just deny everything because they have to prove it, right? Every time you deny something, uh, the, the plaintiff has to prove it. And it's easier to be a defendant, actually, in that case. So you that's how you look at this. So you, so you have to come in with a, you know, sometimes if uh, the other side has an affidavit, you have to counter with your own affidavit. And your affidavit cannot just be general allegations or statements. It has to be specifically controverting, opposing the statements made in the other side's affidavit. So one of the tricks I use, and I'm just going to go back into this, this case that's going in court, right? So you have the debt collectors in there and your motion to dismiss was denied and you get into discovery because you filed your answer, right? So your discovery is this. You ask questions, you ask them to admit certain things, and you ask to, for the production of documents. Those are the most common things you want to do in discovery. Uh, the key thing, the most useful is interrogatories. The most useful is interrogatories and requests for production because... If the plaintiff is alleging a contract, you want the contract. Show me the contract. You said, I have this debt. Okay, how did, what were the terms? I want to see the instrument that expressed the terms. That were, and I want to see a document that you have that shows I consented to those terms. That's my request for production, right? In my interrogatories, I'm going to ask questions about what they're alleging in the complaint. It's very important. So I go through the complaint very carefully. I look at the pleading and I say, okay, this is alleged here. So I want to ask a question or two or three about that, about that matter. Now, it's important to get to the merits of the case this way in discovery. For, like I said, for the summary judgment and all this sort of thing. But here's what's really going to get it. If, okay, so what happens is in with interrogatories, it's a corporation that's suing you. The corporation needs a person to testify as to the answers in the interrogatories. This is according to the rules of civil procedure. So part of my strategy in asking discovery is, yeah, I wanna to get to the merits of what they're alleging. I wanna show how they're lying. 
but I want some of one poor sucker who's going to be chosen to have to answer me under oath. I feel sorry for that guy because he has to keep his job by doing what his boss says. Now, he doesn't answer the questions. The lawyer does. We all know this, right? So he files an affidavit or he answers the interrogatories, but he has to do so under oath. As soon as I get that back in the mail, I immediately send a deposition notice and I want to take his deposition. Now, most of the time I don't get the deposition because they come up with some reason why I can't depose that person. Oh, it's not fair. He's in another state. Uh, he doesn't have knowledge. And I say, thank you very much. And I move to strike his testimony because they just said he doesn't have knowledge. And if I can't cross-examine him, then you can't use his testimony against me. You see how that works? But how do I get how do I get this to come out, right? I have to start discovery. And then the rules cause that person to have to be the one to testify as to the answers. Then I can do a deposition notice. So many times I'll get a, a withdrawal or a dismissal just because the lawyer doesn't want to test out the case because he realizes I kind of know procedure, right? And I'm going to expose the weakness of the fact that he does not have a witness. You see, you can't have a corporation that comes in with a piece of paper saying, this is it. That doesn't work. The corporation cannot testify about the authenticity of a document. Some witness, some custodian of the record has to do so. And he has to have personal firsthand knowledge. And he has to testify that he has that knowledge. And he cannot. He cannot. Because when you ask him, when did you first have knowledge of this case? He'll say last night. And then you say, when was the case filed? Three months ago. So how does your affidavit have any merit? By the way, did you write the affidavit? No, I, my boss told me I have to sign it. <laughs> you see? So don't be afraid of these situations and know that there's ex they're exposed to huge weakness if you just you know, follow some procedure and get yourself a copy of the Rules of Civil Procedure. Now, I'm not saying it's a good use of your time to fight debt collectors. Maybe it is. You know, I learned because I wanted to help others and, and I made money at it. OK, I don't like to make money at that. I would rather, you know, you guys choose how you want to do it and you can do this yourself. You know, I, I have more content on this stuff. But let me just tell you. So you have a case going on in court and you're doing all these things and you really want to end it. And who cares if you make five thousand dollars out of it? OK, fine. Maybe you're happy with maybe you have bragging rights. OK, so you would you would need a pleading that can be filed in the U.S. District Court. Okay. Thanks, Moko. Um, so you have a pleading that can be filed in U.S. District Court. You need a pleading that expresses a cause of action for unfair and deceptive collection practices under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Okay. That's where you would start because I know you're probably thinking, gosh, John says all this stuff so fast. How would I even know how to do that? Well, it's called having a pleading that expresses a cause of action under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act for unfair and deceptive collection practices. You can find an example of that all over the place. The FTC frequently sues debt collectors for groups of people. You can find those pleadings on the internet for free. Okay, you can use AI to write them for you. So, um, Moko, what do you got for questions? Just unmute. Sorry, talking in silence. Okay, well, you know, a number of people are actually asking in the beginning if you could just talk a little bit about um, LLCs being single member versus multi-member and the protection. Okay. And then some people are just asking kind of questions that are easy to answer about like, what's a deposition? What are interrogatories? Like define terms. Okay, let me so define some to terms. Define, okay. All right, so I'm gonna define some terms and I'll explain about, I'm gonna say charging under protection and mm -hmm. removing property from your estate. So, okay. And okay. also discuss the difference between interrogatories and a deposition, please. Okay, uh, interrogatories are questions. That's it. Uh, a deposition is where you ask questions. How about that? In, in person. In person. In person. You speak. But in both situations. Interrogatories. They have, yes. In, interrogatories and depositions are about questions under oath. So the answer should be uh, given under oath. Mm -hmm. It's very important. These are very good strategies to get the, to the truth. Uh, it's a very good system, actually. It's just being abused, okay, right yeah. now. It's being abused because many people don't understand it. That's why I do this work because I want people to understand this. If you go to a lawyer, he's just gonna he's gonna cheat you in so many ways. Um, by the way, let me just make this one comment. So, if you have lots of debt, more debt is better. I've had so many clients come to me after I work with them, and they'll say, "Gosh, you know, I really wish I had way more debt when I came to you because." It, it, I, I just really came out ahead here, you know, 
<laughs> if you have lots of credit card debt and it, it doesn't make sense to pay anymore, realize that they're not going to be hurting, okay? If you borrow money from grandma, please pay her back. But the bankers actually make money if you don't pay them. So just know that part. But if you just let them sue you, you can make yourself uncollectible for like uh, bank accounts. That's pretty easy to do, which I'm going to explain in just a minute. But if, if you just let them sue you and garnish your wages, you got California that lets, it, you gar lets them garnish 25% of your take-home pay. New York is 10%. Pennsylvania, they don't let you garnish anything. South, South Carolina, North Carolina cannot garnish wages. Texas cannot garnish wages. So those four states cannot garnish wages. New York's 10%. California is 25. You never ask for exemptions. Here's what happens. You let them garnish your wages and just suffer through that, but it'll block everybody else. So if you have $5 million in debt, you're going to pay the same, the same exact amount of money if you get a wage levy as the guy who has $5,000 in debt. Because the, the, the debt's based on your, the, the law limits the collection to your ability to pay. It's, it creates a, it creates a, um, uh, let's say, a, a limitation on how many creditors, judgment creditors, can garnish your paycheck. So if you just let the first one do it without any exemptions, don't ask for exemptions, just let them garnish it, it'll block everybody else. And chances are those debts will expire by the time the first or second one are finished. That's way better. I mean, even if you think you have to pay, right, if you, if you feel better paying – You'll be paying, but a smaller, smaller, smaller amount, much smaller amount, and not going further into debt, not creating tax liabilities if you just let them garnish your check. So that comes out of the Consumer Credit Protection Act. And by the way, much of this legislation was, was pushed in the 70s by Ralph Nader. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Ralph mm -hmm. Nader pushed in the Consumer Protection Laws, specifically in Title 15, Section 1601. And what we're talking about today is 1692. There's 1691 and all these other sections, but... He was responsible for getting all that on the books, and it did get kind of whittled down a little bit. But if you know how to use it, you got quite a bit of leverage and power against these these lawyers. And really, you can mop the floor with them. I love I love to describe it that way. You should see how crazy they get. They they will just pay you. They 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 hate it that you can you can figure this out. So, how do I take property? How do I have use property money cash and and avoid a levy? Well, it can't be mine. That was the, the realization I came to in the 90s. How do I how do I protect property without by, by guaranteeing that I can protect it? How do I, how do I do without question? Well, don't have it. Well, that's not practical for people. You got to have stuff, right? Well, that doesn't mean you have to like have title to it. It just means you get to use it. So here's a hypothetical example. If I have fifty thousand dollars in the bank and I owe a bunch of uh, creditors. And I don't do anything. The creditors can sue me and get a judgment lien, and then they can literally wipe out my entire account in in one day, if they if the debt's that high, right? Fifty thousand dollars, right? But if I have fifty thousand dollars in the account and it's my limited liability account, let's just say now it's not a personal account; it's now an LLC account, and I'm the single member owner of that LLC because I registered it in the state of Florida and as a single member owner. Okay, the banks can still levy that account. Why? Because it's all mine. There is no other innocent party who has an interest in that money. That's the key. Now, it is a little more difficult on a single member. They have to do a little extra work, but they will they will be able to if they wanted to, okay? So the way you avoid this, and this includes with the IRS, is you add another party. So in the articles, you would simply like, for in my case, maybe I add my brother, okay? So now my brother and I, we don't do anything. We don't have joint contracts with each other. We don't file tax returns jointly. Uh, we don't have joint liability anywhere. He's completely outside of anything I do in business. So I would just call up and say, hey, you want to be a thing, a nominee on my company? And he'll say, like a lot of people do, he'll say, why? Am I going to get sued? <laughs> Am I going to owe taxes? You know, and of course not. You know, it's just a nominee and there's no interest. You're not getting money. If you're getting paid, that's a different scenario. But you can have a friend or family member, not a spouse friend or family member who's right. an adult, yeah, be on the articles with you. So what, here's what happens. So the ownership now is through the name of the LLC. Now, the because there's now two members, the LLC is understood and seen in law as a separate party from yourself. Before, it's not. So here's how I describe this. Having a two-member LLC in which the two members are not married, and they're both adults, they're legally able to contract. 
This separates the property rights in the LLC from your estate and the other person's estate. So even if that person filed a bankruptcy, it would not affect the property in the LLC because it's not part of his estate. Same for the both of them. So I could have all kinds of debt craziness over here. And if he put all the money in there, it doesn't affect his money because it's his money. He's an innocent party. And this is what the statute recognizes. It's called charging order protection. Now, in Australia, I don't believe that's recognized. So you have to get there with your statutory limited company. And you have to make sure that your bylaws reflect this type of condition. So let me describe the condition like I just did for my partner. He was just sitting here. He said, how does this work? Just like you asked, okay? He said, so before this call, you were having this conversation, right? I said, well, imagine if you uh, put $100,000 on the table right here, and I put $100,000 on the table, and it's just sitting there. <clears throat> and then we go and invest it, and we, let's say we make a million dollars, right? Well, to get, each of us together have an interest in it, and it's, it can be, we can calculate that. Your interest was 100, mine was 100, so it's 50-50. And now if it's worth a million, we have a realized gain. We have no protection. We're individually liable for taxes and everything else, right? And if someone sues us, they can come and reach in and take the money. And let's say it's the money's not on the table. Let's say it's in a bank account somewhere. He is a signer and I'm a signer. We have zero protection. We have all kinds of tax liability, okay? But if we hold the money in a corporate partnership or a limited liability company, a third party, in which we have an ownership interest, and then we, our arrangement is like this. Once we contribute the money, we can't take it out unless we vote on together. We make an agreement as to how and when the money can be taken out. So we have that in our operating agreement. It says we haven't decided yet, but at some point when we do decide, we can then take it. So at that moment, I don't have the right to take the money out. He doesn't have the right to take the money out. What that does is preclude any creditor from stepping in our shoes and taking the right because we don't have the right. Does that make sense, Moko? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. I... I've divested my exclusive right in property by sharing it into a group. Now, so the, there's innocent parties in the group. You so that's um, listed in your operating agreement and yeah. you would show that to the bank? You never have to show your operating, in all my years of doing this, mm -hmm. I've never had to show an operating agreement. This is the beauty of the LLC. I love this because I registered articles with the Secretary of State and I don't want any privacy there. I want people to see that I'm not the only member because that will discourage litigation. That mm -hmm. will discourage it. If my property is titled into trust, some lawyer thinks he's a smart guy. He's going to subpoena my trust document, my declaration of trust and all these. Uh, he's going to try to pierce the trust and it's possible. He will, he'll do something, you know, but the LLC statute is controlling. I didn't write it. The state legislature did it. And there's a, horrendous penalty if the lawyer tries to be a smart guy and go in there and try to say that I don't qualify for charging order protection or come in there and tell the judge that he still wants a writ of execution, a charging order against my interest in the company. Okay. So if he does that, he gets a charging order. Be careful what you ask for. If you get that charging order, and you don't collect any money or you only collect some of the money, your client is going to have to pay taxes on the amount of money that were not collected. What lawyer wants to do that to his client? Think about mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Huge penalty. I mean, it comes down to, not, it's not just a penalty. It, 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 it's, a, it's a, it would change your career. Deterrent. <laughs> You're a lawyer and, and you do this, it's actually negligent to actually undertake this effort when you're, the debtor has charging order protection. You're better off doing a credit sweep, a bank sweep and waiting, sitting on his credit file, sitting on the public records. You're much better off waiting than if you get a charging order. I don't think I, I may have seen two charging orders in my entire career. 31. So then people are wondering why they should have a single member PNA. Okay, it's single useful. Member LLC. It, it's very convenient and useful. Many people can't easily find another member. Okay, so I say, okay, use a single member. Now, if you come to me and you're in that situation, and you're you're facing a levy imminently, I'm not going to tell you to keep a single member. I'm going to tell you to have a two member LLC, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you the consequences of not doing that. Then it's up to you. So I'll do a single member LLC, and I want you to understand the difference in why we do one or the other. So if you ever need that situation, I've had clients come back and say. Okay, I'm getting sued now. And I'll say, well, add your Uncle Bob, <laughs> you know, and amend the articles and you're then you're good.
So here's a question. Someone's saying that in Hawaii, they require LLCs to pay GE taxes. I don't know what that is on gross income, separate from Hawaii state taxes. Are you familiar with that? Who's required? Like, like I told you before, they require. They, who's they? Yeah, you're reading some comments on a website, probably. There's no right. law that imposing a duty to testify against yourself. Right. So, it's what he was talking about earlier, Kat. Yeah, you don't file the return. It's very simple. You don't file the return. That's it. It's very simple. Imagine having a company that holds title to real estate. It doesn't make any money. It doesn't even have a bank account. It's not required to, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't handle money. Or if it does, it handles a suitcase of cash, right? Now, so, now John, um, Batman is asking, he's saying, okay, so you set up your LLC with a, a you know, um, a charging order protection. And uh, Batman's wondering, doesn't it have to be done preventively and not when you need it, or it can be reversed by the court? He's saying, explain, he's asking you to explain the court of court. Oh, it, can be, it can be both. It can be both. You can do it on the fly. Yeah, it's, I've, it's, not, it's not a fraudulent conveyance. And even with a fraudulent conveyance, one that I've done many of those, by the way, they qualify for fraudulent conveyance. No one challenges it. It's too much money. A good question, though. But yeah, it's okay. not it's not an issue. I see a lot of hands up. Do you want to? Yeah, Karen K. Karen K. What do you have? Hey, John. Um, so have you dealt with Citibank? And I know they use more more law associates as a debt collector but i don't i haven't figured out what their relationship is because more law seems to um be able to go back to citibank on the original account i had a friend that was getting sued by citibank and um she couldn't use the typical third party debt collector strategies against more law because they they had some unique relationship with Citibank. Well, first of all, Moore Law doesn't represent Citibank. There is a single attorney representing Citibank, but Moore Law is the debt collector. And okay. so is the individual attorney. So there is that going on there. But if you're saying that the lawyer can go back to the bank and get records, that's fine. Uh, you know, whatever. Okay. That's okay. Um, in the beginning, just so uh, I want to clarify what I... I um, might have heard you say, so if you would get sued by Citibank or another big creditor directly, did you say that the lawyer suing you would be considered the debt collector and you could use some of the strategies that you just talked about? Yes, that's correct. Okay. The okay. individual attorney is a debt collector and so is the law firm that he works for. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and the law firm, by the way, cannot represent a plaintiff. Law firms cannot practice law. So law mm -hmm. firms cannot make an appearance. And you'll see a lot of times, many times law firms will make it, they'll make an appearance. They'll say, uh, the, hereby, uh, the plaintiff hereby appears by and through its attorney and then the name of the law firm, LLC or LLP or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I file a motion to strike and say, LLPs cannot practice law, it's illegal. And you see how fast they fix everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the individual lawyer. Yeah, the lawyers individually can uh, have standing uh, the, uh, to practice law is how they do it. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, Thank you. Mike? All right, Mike? Yes, I have a question about got an interesting case. I bought some building lots in the state of Maine with a partner. And through the process, I found out that if you are a non resident of the state of Maine and you sell property to anybody non-resident sells property they take two and a half percent tax who does uh, the state of maine and it's the how does the state get involved that. in the sale well um the title company send out documents every every document that said i understand the lawyers yeah okay oh, yeah the lawyers they they help the state that's what they do okay Sure. Yeah, so so if, if, if you want to avoid that, you just establish the residency. So you would, the simple way to do it is to have your the owner of the LLC be a resident or make the LLC domesticated in the state. Pretty easy to do. Okay. Well, can, I, I think you can sell it into, you know, you. Um, I could probably sell it. Could, could I just start an LLC in the state of Maine? Yeah. Just, just file I, one there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or make well, the owner a resident. You can do it that way. Well, or both owners. Yeah, so my partner is 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 the uh, is a resident. So could I make him the member and meet just the authorized sure. signatory? Yeah, I think, and you'd have to get some uh, instruction. But I think one of you being a resident, 
even though the LLC is the party, the owner of the LLC being a resident, it should be enough to avoid that two and a half percent. Okay, well, can he be the owner or member and I be the authorized signatory? Sure, you can be the non non member manager. Sure, non member signer. Sure, you could do that. Yeah, just have okay, him be the hundred percent owner. Sure, that'll work. It might okay, be just as easy to to domesticate your LLC. It might be just as easy. I mean, like if you got a notice or something, or if you're aware of this, all you got to do is file the articles in the, With the secretary of state. For yeah, Maine, right? it'll take yeah. you like five minutes. Yeah. yeah, just file the articles in Maine. Yeah. Okay, file the articles of my LLC. Yeah, whatever is you're dealing with, whatever would be paying the tax because it's let's say the title holder, and it's a non-resident, you would just domesticate that company by filing the articles with your Secretary of State. With the main Secretary of State in Maine, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The choose Secretary Maine. of State. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Of okay, all so the I fifty just, states, choose me. <laughs> I keep the same LLC and domesticate it there because some. The people there told me, well, all the members have to be main state residents. And okay. My member is my PM. Now, who's the owner of the property? My uh, my LLC. Okay, so the it. LLC needs to be a resident. Ignore all those idiots, okay? They're probably attorneys telling you that. They're idiots. The owner of the property has to be a resident. You're a resident if you're registered as an LLC with the state. That's it. The okay, owners so of I the can... LLC do not have to be residents in that case. So I can just take the existing LLC, domesticate it. Yeah. File, yeah. File. Yeah. And if someone's telling you these things, ask them for the statute they're talking about. That would help you because you can be very specific on what the requirements are. And it is a taxing statute. It's okay. It just did. That's what's on the books and you have to go along with that. But you can get, overcome it by simply establishing residency. Okay. And I don't have to establish my own personal residency there. I just need well, I think you can have the owners be residents and meet the criteria, or you can have the LLC, the owner of the property, be a resident. I'm not sure. Again, check the statute language in there. But okay. I think if the title holder is a resident, you're okay. Okay, the title holder is the LLC that I'm the authorized signatory for, and it's a, a member is a PMA. Well, okay, but the PMA... Okay. I had a case like that in Oregon and New Mexico, and we used the PMA to just claim the PMA was a resident to, to serve the client. We just made up whatever that we needed to do, and they, they just hate that, but they couldn't tax anything. They couldn't withhold anything. So yeah, I guess it, it depends. I'd have to see more detail, but I'm just going to say simply that if your LLC is domesticated there, who cares who the owner is? Doesn't matter. Okay. Because the other option was to just open an LLC there and sell sell it to sell the land to that LLC for a dollar and be done. You don't have it. to do it that way. You can just convey it over there. You can convey it over for the sole purpose of defeating the tax. You don't have to okay, tell anybody that, right. but yeah, you don't need a dollar for that. You just you just can you can convey title to it, just quit claim it or whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's a. Uh, um, and I got a question. Is a member syn synonymous with owner? Yes. In the LLCs, yes. Okay. But the organizer is not. Organizer and the or, manager. Organizer can be anybody, can be an owner or not. Doesn't matter. And organizer has no liability either. It's like the registered agent. They're kind of the same. They don't have any liability, no ownership interest. Mm. Although the, the organizer can be also be the member. But as organizer, have no liability. Okay. Well, the in, in North Carolina, on the application form, it says, you know, it, 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 there's one spot you can be member or member manager or organizer. Then it says list of corporate officers, optional. So do I even have to list the PMA or any of that and even disclose that? I like to, it's like I explained before, I like to show that the ownership is a certain way so I can discourage litigation and collections. Sometimes okay. I like to show, sometimes you may not want. Okay, got it. So to put yeah. that on, there and they look at it. That might kill any litigation before it ever starts. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to aim for. I want to defeat cost of litigation. If I can do that, I'm going to really solve a lot of problems. Okay. Okay. I, that's no, I don't I don't always talk about that, but when I'm working for a client, my first thought is, how do I avoid cost of litigation in the future? <laughs> okay. Now, um, 
the question is i i had a a bank where, where um i'm with a partner we're closing on a, a real estate loan and you know i sent a, i sent them an operator he said we got to see the operating agreement so i sent them one and they said, it can't say pma or anything you shouldn't there. be doing that so i just changed should, took off PMA. no you, no 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 you shouldn't be doing that you you're you're mudding up the closing you're mudding up the lending process because what you need to establish is whether or not the bank has an underwriting criteria for an LLC. If it doesn't, it has no business talking about the LLC. The fact that it is is because you brought it up. So you need to back out of that. Because I can well, I, yeah. I don't think they have underwriting for LLC. So why are they even talking about it? They just want more information from you. No, yeah, well, the LLC is buying the property, getting the loan. Yeah, but it's not. You're getting the loan. Okay. The bank is not well, lending to the LLC, trust me. Okay. Ask them, say, what's your underwriting? Is this a business loan to the LLC where there's no guarantor? Ask them that. They're going to say, hell no. <laughs> okay. What are we talking about the LLC for? You shouldn't be talking to me about that. It's, that's just holding title. I'm backing the loan. Yeah, yeah. You should never disclose your operating agreement. I've well, never had I a situation just, where I had to. Okay, well, this I, I took the majority of it out and just gave a loan, like a boilerplate. Okay. Um, but still, you shouldn't be talking about the LLC because there's no underwriting for an LLC. So they don't get to talk about your LLC. Don't let them. Later, okay. you can transfer the title over to an LLC and retain beneficial interests. You know, there's a way to do that. And then let the bank know and they'll have to accept it. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're actually, it's a big finance and it, and it is titled in the name of the LLC already. That's fine. I mean, I like to do it after the closing because you're not getting loans in an LLC. Unless it has a balance sheet in its commercial loan, right? So if your LLC has a balance sheet that qualifies, yeah, you can find some lending for an LLC, but chances are you don't. Okay. All right. So I need to challenge that in the future. Just say, just well, back you, out of all. Say, look, give my records back. Those were erroneous, anyways. Give them back. We're not. You're not underwriting for an LLC. Why are you asking for these documents? Well, because you brought it up. Okay. Say, so, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have brought it up. I'm just the borrower here. Okay. I'll deal with the titling later. Okay. Cause I did have, I did, I did. They asked for the, whatever that they gave me a document. I said, Wait, let me, let me go on. I'm sorry. I, I can't have a regular discussion. I'm going to do Q and a, but I can't have regular discussions with everybody. iPad. What did you want to ask? Yeah. Hi. Hi again. It's, it's Tiffany here. Australia. Hey, Tiffany. hey. Hey. Um, well, I'll just keep it, keep it brief. Obviously. How? What's the best way to talk to you about uh, a situation for myself regarding taking crypt, taking profits from cryptos? Uh, if if you didn't want to set up a, a PTY company, because I I will double check, but I believe we do have to provide operating um, agreements to to banks over here for trust every, every I know. Look, there's, years. Just, there's ways of doing things okay <laughs> just because you're being told that doesn't mean that's the final thing and yeah but anyways yeah we can discuss this i have many australian clients uh just schedule with a at aceofcoins.com and i know yeah, you're, there's a big time question. difference yeah yeah how's i'm actually on your privacy fight uh website and there's a contact is a support should i just no, use uh, aceofcoins.com, and then I understand about your time. So, so yeah, um, you can put a time on the calendar, but email me separately and, and let me know a time yeah. because I know you're uh, 12, 13 hours different from Florida. Right. I just wanted a, a, just a five-minute um, rundown on whether it can be done, and, yes, if, if it's confident, without having to, you know, have a battle with the ATO in court or <laughs> no, you're never going to have that. But yeah, I always and like to avoid the battle. controversy. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm happy, be happy to yeah, do some work with you. And I know you say five minutes. That's fine if it's five minutes, but it's probably not. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Just, just trying to follow, follow what's the yeah. best route for me. I'm all right. Not all sure right. Any I look forward to it. Yeah. Stuff. Please schedule, but then let's organize a time where we can get together. Okay. I will do. All Thanks. Right. All right. And, and anyone else? Did, did, did we cover enough today? The John's iPhone. Who's that? It's not me. That's that. Yeah, this is John Gibson. Howdy, hey John. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've talked to you. We've uh, since moved down to Texas recently. Ah. And uh, we're currently renting until we uh, can buy a home. But um, 
or, you know, until we find what we want and, and so forth. But um, I'm just wondering about property taxes. The property taxes down here are just incredible. Are there things, if I get with you, that we can do ahead of time? I, I don't like purchasing? to get into that situation. If you're in that situation, you know, there, you're into it for a battle on resting control of the property using an easement, right? Uh, okay. there, there, I believe you can get them to back off on the property tax, but your life is easier if you just offset the property tax with an asset. I know you probably don't want to hear it that way, but I'm I'm trying this out myself before I start saying, hey, guys, let's do that. And uh, I'm working with some people that are in a situation where we only have limited options and we're trying to use the easements. So that'll just be a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I would just recommend, I know it's a lot of money on the property taxes. Just try to offset the liability with some something that produces cash flow. That's my best okay. recommendation and make your life easier. Okay. All right. Well, I might uh, go ahead and engage you again sometime. Yeah, and, look forward uh, to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Thanks so much. All right. I'm going to end for tonight unless you guys want to have anything, something. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I know I, I like to cover a lot of things, but uh uh, that's a general idea. Don't be afraid of things, but be specific. Know who you're dealing with. Don't refer to an attorney as they. It's some person, right? Uh, and there's a debt collector or there's a creditor suing you, right? So be specific. Um, just one last note. I've got a one. Uh, it's a, turning into a child custody divorce type of case. And the wife wants to make a hard time and, and make all kinds of false allegations for the husband. And she... Uh, accused him of uh, abuse and, and neglect and then in her affidavit to get a restraining order there's no statement reflecting abuse or neglect mm -hmm. she, she just didn't like something <laughs> you know <laughs> or he used profanity oh so she said but whatever so you know what do you do in that situation so this is an example I'm, hopefully you're not in that situation like with a divorce thing like this but here's what we do in that situation so there are allegations made to get the judge to issue a restraining order. And the basis of that is that there's an imminent harm, right? A risk to physical safety, okay? That's the criteria. Now, what she said doesn't qualify, but hey, I'm not the judge. The judge did this, okay? So the way you overcome this is not by calling up the ex and saying, blah, 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 or showing up at the hearing on the, on the hearing to establish a permanent injunction because she already got the temporary. You're gonna get that automatically. Uh, when you go to the hearing for the permanent, you don't want to go there and just talk. You have to file an affidavit. So the, what we did today is we went through each and every statement she made, which is like maybe 12. And we came up with a statement and supporting facts to go with each. And it came out to like maybe 20 statements that we used to overcome her statements that she used to get the restraining order. This is how you have to do things. And we made it into an affidavit. And those statements were very specific to what she said and based on personal knowledge. And yeah, I made some argumentative statements in there, but most of it was personal knowledge. And I got the client to explain it to me. I used his statements and I you know, made a couple of revisions and whatnot, but we're bringing the affidavit tomorrow to the hearing and that's necessary. Now, I also explained and that there's a mediation day. I should ask him how that went, but I also explained he wants to tell the, uh, the attorney, her attorney, that he's going to cross-examine her statements that allowed her to get a restraining order at a deposition. <laughs> See, this is how you protect yourself and this is how you use the rules of procedure. And one last example, somebody had a, um, a lease agreement, it was a commercial lease agreement, and the person that was managing the property was just being a jerk and imposing all these new obligations that were not in the lease agreement. And the person I'm working with said, he didn't wanna pay anymore. And so he just stopped paying the rent. <laughs> well, that makes him in default and he's going to he's going to lose the property and he's going to be evicted and he's going to owe the debt for the full amount of the contract. And I said, you can't just not pay. This is not third grade. OK, you have to follow the contract. He goes, what do I do? I said, follow the contract. What is the contract? What did you agree to? <laughs> Go back to that. And, and I said, the procedure is like this. If you have a dispute, a material dispute, which is what it is over the property and under the lease terms, what you need to do is open a case file in your court and pay the rent into the court's trust account. And then the other party will have to go to the court to get the money and have to explain why he's entitled to the money. Yeah. That's how yeah. it works. So anyways, know that there's, there's methods of, of doing things 
and uh, don't be intimidated by it, but don't act like a child. And I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just saying sometimes, you know, even though we're adults, we go through life and sometimes because we haven't learned a thing, we're going to act like a person who never learned more about a thing than when he was seven years old. Just realize that when that's happening, I'm there, I've done it, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, that's, you know, just realize what's happening. This is a very sophisticated system. It's a system of business and banking, okay? And it's being used sometimes against us because we don't know what we're doing or we're not learning, we're not thinking, okay, there's gotta be a set of rules that we can all follow. And I'm trying to show you, let's, let's do that. There is a set of rules and we can all use them. All right? Anybody wanna add anything? So I'm gonna go. Thank you. It's a great presentation. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate y'all joining. Hey, uh, quick. You, you take uh, you take crypto payments, don't you? On uh, ASIC. On Coins? occasion, if if Jim's if Jim's willing, Jim is my uh, conversion guy. Okay. Yeah, we can work that out though. And you're awesome. gonna thank you. You're gonna put this. Um, you're gonna put this on. Uh, private yeah, website it's it's recorded, and I will send you guys a link. And if I haven't for the last one, I will do that also. Yes, I thank you, yeah, Joe. Yes. Yeah, we asked the when we went to call, we asked the judge. Let me, let me talk to you guys later. I'm definitely Everybody gonna talk to you guys later because I'm gonna I'm gonna I, you guys I, gonna help me make some new content. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Hey, hey okay. John. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Nice weekend. You still you there, too. John.